Well, good morning, 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 everybody. How you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I am Sean Butler. Bugsy Malone is just up in front. You'll see her shortly. This is your Saturday morning Tottenham News, Views and Clues update. I hope you're all happy and healthy doing the things you love with the people that you love doing them with. Please do me a favour, guys. Hit the like button for me. If you enjoy the content, hit the subscribe button too. If you have not already done so, and even if you have double check you still are people keep getting unsubscribed let's start off with football insiders peter o'rourke pete o'rourke the man who has more exclusives than i don't know someone who's got a lot of exclusives run out of steam with that analogy anyway he came out this morning saying that overnight talks have developed with regard antonio noosa the breakthrough has materialised and that Tottenham are closing in on the deal. Other people on Twitter are saying it's about to happen. The guy that knows a little thing or two about a thing or two that I happen to know said Monday. But you know what? I'm not attaching myself to any such claim. But it looks like it's getting progression, progressing, and things are getting closer. I do think Paul O'Keefe did also say for what it's worth, he kind of dampened the, the progress talks a little bit on, I think it was late last night when he said, or yesterday afternoon, he said, we're just a number of clubs that are doing exploratory talks. Tottenham are ahead of the queue, but it's not that far along, so to speak. I don't know, I've got a feeling this one is going to happen, and I'm very excited about it, but we're not going to spend too much time talking about Antonio Nusa because I feel like I've done about four hours worth of conversations, discussions, video analysis, stats and all that stuff about him. Uh, you can look up here, I'll put a link to one of the more recent videos if you haven't seen it. Anyway, moving swiftly on, Tottenham, according to other reports, the pursuit of Conor Gallagher is now over. According to reports on Twitter, according to places, People that are in the know more on the Chelsea side of things and the Tottenham side of things saying it's basically a dead rubber story. He's not leaving. He doesn't want to go to Tottenham and we should all just move on. But from the Tottenham side of things, a lot of those ITKs are saying, and I quote, I forget who it was who said this, but I quote, Conor Gallagher is Ange Postacoglu's first, second and third choice for that 6-8 hybrid role. As I said to you in the last video when I spoke about him, the more I think about it and as time goes on, the less inclined I am to want to see him come to Tottenham for a number of different reasons. The FFP factor, I don't want to help Chelsea out. I don't really want someone who doesn't really want to be here. And I've got to be honest, I know there's that statistical bomber that has been touted saying that there is no better midfielder that's done more in the combination the cocktail of factors that a 6-8 hybrid needs to do in terms of shots on goal chances created tackles interceptions blocks key passes he's done more as a combo than anybody else in the top five leagues and it does sound impressive but when you watch him recently he might be doing that stuff but he also does a lot of other things that slows down the play and i haven't been impressed with the eye test over the last four or five games in succession that i've seen him it's interesting because I think there's also another st stats bomber that's knocking about this morning about Pierre Mohoibier. And I'll see if I can grab it from a WhatsApp group and put it on the screen for you. Because this is another thing where maybe the stats and the seeing eye test don't always line up. And depending on your personal flavour, whether you trust your eyes or whether you trust the stats, or whether you like to lean into both, you know, a little bit this way, a little bit that way, then sometimes your eyes can deceive you. Sometimes the stats can be deceiving because Pierre Mohoibier, who's like sixth choice, at Tottenham in the centre midfield role. Well, he is, I think, number, I think he's number one for progressive passes in the Premier League per 90, number two for forward passes. I'll put it up on the screen. I can't remember the details, but very impressive stats. Yet, you know, if you were watching him like I was against Burnley and against Bournemouth, you would have seen a lot of, you know, lack of interest, a lot of wastefulness, a lot of misplaced passes and a lot of kind of CBA uh, energy. So maybe, you know, if you were to believe the majority of reports, you would you would lean into the idea that it's not going to happen, at least not now. Maybe it's something we'll turn our attention to again in the summer when he'll have six months left on his contract, 12 months left. And, you know, then the kind of leverage in the negotiation moves in different directions again. You, maybe you can make the argument that it's, you know, Levy time to come and 
do his hard hardball negotiations. You could also make the argument that there's more leverage into the hands of the agents of Conor Gallagher, with regards to the club at least, for the fear of losing him at a cheaper valuation that doesn't necessarily help Chelsea's FFP to the same degree a deal that would happen now could help. So, you know, again, always, like I say, with these things, there's always a, you know, a gazillion moving pieces on the chessboard. I was saying 3D chess a lot yesterday on the live stream. I meant to say 4D chess or 5D chess. But there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of, uh, a lot of variables that, that have different weightings now that will have, again, different weightings in the future. But I, I for one, like I say, the more I think about it, the less and less inclined I am to, to, to want Conor Gallagher. I'll still get on board it. If, if Ange does really see him as first, second and third choice, you know, of course I'll trust the process. But, um, and I would be, wish him well and back him if he came into the club. But if I had my choice, I still would rather us go in a different direction. And that particular direction doesn't even include necessarily, as I said before, a full-time permanent signing right now. I just think I've got a really sneaking suspicion that in the summer there's going to be a lot of opportunities that we can't even foresee right now. Players that we, you know, that we would imagine as of right now are very much fixed parts of the furniture, fixed assets almost at some football clubs, but that because of the pressures of FFP and PSR that will you know, find themselves part of transfer rumours and transfer stories that may in fact become reality. And so I feel like at the moment FFP is creating, obviously for the clubs that have been affected, Everton and Nottingham Forest, there's their earthquakes. Massive, massive foundational damage done to their opportunities uh, for the next, or for the, as a going concern really for some of them. But in terms of the rest of the footballing world, I feel like there's just tremors that are starting. But whether or not those tremors become earthquakes, I think we'll have to wait and see um, who gets affected, how it affects them, and what are the kind of outcomes. And so I don't necessarily want Tottenham to play their hand just yet. I do believe that in the summer, as June the 30th approaches and these clubs have looked at their accounts, done their audits, and are worried about you know, how far away from being within or over that threshold of £105 million in the three-year reporting period they are, you might just find some phone calls that happen on, you know, in the last week of June from certain chairmen saying, hey, listen, we need, to get our, you know, we need to get our numbers on side here. So in order to do that, we've probably got to sell one of our better assets. And as I say, I think that you might just find some very, very interesting developments in June and I'd like Tottenham to have enough of their powder having been kept dry in order to take full advantage. I'm not sure if Tottenham have got enough about our midfield right now with the news of Bissouma catching malaria, you know, horrible news for him. I really hope he gets better and malaria. I mean, I think we were told, if I'm not wrong and correct me if I am, that he, you know, had, he struggled really badly with COVID when he caught it um, last year. I mean, my brother's had malaria and it, you know, was the worst thing he's gone through. And my brother's had things like dengue fever and all sorts of stuff. He lives out in Singapore and has travelled in parts of the world over there that have exposed him to some pretty nasty, uh, nasty illnesses. And, yeah, apparently malaria is, is, uh, is, is brutal. So, you know, I don't know how long that will take the sumer to get back from or to get fully fit from. Pape Sar, obviously, we still away on the international duty. You hope he comes through that unscathed and can come back and participate. Benson Core, we, we're good with. And I think we still, you know, we have options. But you've got to be honest, when you look at Lo Celso's injury record and Hoy Bier, we've already just spoken about Hoy Bier's, you know, is he really committed at the moment? If we have a conversation with him and say, look, I know you want to, to go, but we can't afford to leave, lose you right now. We need you to be a part of this. You are a main part of this journey for the next six months at least. Will he buy in? You'd hope you could lean into his general professionalism and general integrity to, to get the best out of him. I know he doesn't necessarily suit the system, but like I say, the stats I've, I think I'll have put on the screen by now kind of do tell a story that in terms of what you're looking for, progression and um, you know, forward momentum in games, then, then he, he offers that, which make, begs the question, why is it that Oli Skip has been prioritised ahead of um, Pierre Mahoy Bier in some of the last games. And obviously in Oli Skip, you've got a player that divides opinion as well. I think most Tottenham fans, whilst they see moments and flashes of brilliance like that kind of low-cut cross 
come long ball, direct pass, whatever you want to call it, against Manchester United. Some people reflect on his performance in that game thinking he was actually really good. I personally didn't think he was apart from that moment. But you know, we do have options, but not strong enough options to really, in my opinion, like grab the opportunity for the rest of this season and, and run with it. I think we are a player short in the midfield and I'd like to see Tottenham get something done. But I would also, like I say, for me, the preference right now is to not miss the wood for the trees to keep one eye on the bigger prize here, which is what we're going to be doing, hopefully, for the next three or four years. And I don't want Tottenham to necessarily shoot themselves in the foot now if the right opportunity, if the right player isn't available at the right price, then don't commit. You know, I'm sure we can maybe find a loan deal. Pay a hefty loan fee like we've done with Timo Werner. Take on someone's wages you know, immediately from a club that's already looking at FFP and is thinking about things like, well, we're only... If we carry on the way we're going, then we are going to breach FFP, but only by a few million quid. How do we save a few million quid between now and June to make sure that we're this side without having to sell an asset? Or maybe they would loan one of their better players out and the club takes on you know, the, the entirety of their wages and pays a, a loan fee. Something like that could be also an opportunity that presents itself. And I think, again, Tottenham then can get some help right now through the door but that doesn't have to necessarily be the the player you know that you're settling for rather than um you know the bride that you want if that makes sense so for me i think that you know we've got to be smart about this there's still 10 11 days left in the window we've done most of the work we wanted to do you'd hope that antonio noose is also going to get done and that will be something we can look forward to seeing you know come back and be a, a, a real a real boon for our chances next season but in terms of getting something through the door for the midfield role right now, you know, I'd hope that Tottenham can um, you know, get all of the heads, all the smart heads in the room together and, and, and look at the situation that, um, that other clubs are in. Maybe identify one or two of the clubs. Maybe it could be a Fulham, for example. Maybe a team like Fulham, you know, there was the rumours that they were right on the threshold of breaching FFP. So maybe a conversation with them could happen and say, look, how close are you to the threshold? And if you are really close, but you don't want to have to sell a player, you know, we could take someone off, off your hands like a Polinia for six months. I'm spitballing here. Probably, that's probably completely unrealistic, but you understand the kind of the method to the madness I'm trying to represent. You know, you pay them £5 million for, for the rest of the season, take them, pay 100% of his wages. That keeps Fulham, you know, the right side of FFP in the summer. So I don't know. Again, smarter heads than, than mine should be thinking about this stuff at Tottenham Hotspur. In terms of outgoings, guys, look, there's lots. There's lots of things to talk about. Joe Roden, Leeds United are thinking about making that deal permanent or trying to suggest the conclusion to that. They've fallen in love with Joe Roden. 26 years old, Joe Roden. Where's the time gone? He seems to have... He's halfway through his career and it's only just getting going. And But he's doing wonderful things at Leeds United. They love him. And according to reports, you know, Tottenham are looking to get anywhere between 10 and £20 million pound for the guy. I'll be entirely honest, guys. I didn't. I kind of forgotten that he was part of the Tottenham squad, you know. And I'd certainly written off any valuation in my mind of him, to the point where, when it was spoken about yesterday on Savage Show, I was like, I'd take six or seven million quid for him. But, you know, according to a lot of these reports, 15, 20 million pound isn't beyond the realms of possibility, which is wonderful to me. That comes across like pure profit, you know, because I've I've completely forgotten about the player's value as an asset. We're also hearing rumours that Tottenham are willing to let go of Brian Hill right now, this January, and are willing to lower their asking price for him to a paltry seven or eight million. Now, what does that tell you about Tottenham's sort of change in direction that they're, you know, Daniel Levy's usually the guy who, you know, wants to charge Rolls-Royce prices for, you know, Rover level vehicles. And that's held us back. Brian Hill, for, for sure, is worth more than seven million quid, the talent that he has. And that might just pick up or peak the ears, prick the ears, shall we say, of a lot of Spanish clubs that don't have a lot of money, but can probably find a way to afford that for a player of his talents who generally would suit that, that system and that uh, league's pace and kind of technicality far better than the Premier League. So, again, I'm open to it and we shall see. Also, rumours I don't think I've mentioned to you about Ben Davies also being looked at and um, desired by Leeds United. But that'll be something for the summer. If we go down that path, then Tottenham really are through, you know, getting through the deadwood, so to speak. And we, there'll be very few left of the, 
Conte era, of the of the Jose era, of the Pochettino era, which is wonderful things. And and you have to keep bearing in mind, guys. We we did this yesterday, this conversation again. We sat on Sabah's show that. You look at teams like Nottingham Forest, right? How much turnover of, of teams. They did it two seasons ago and they did it again last season. And the first half of their first season in the Premier League, it took a long time for the dust to settle, for them to kind of acclimate and to figure the figure out the chemistry that was required. The second half of that season, Steve Cooper did a really good job and, and made Nottingham Forest you know, a force to be reckoned with. And obviously it didn't work out for them this season. But again, as, as they come into the second half of the season and Nuno has gone in there, a lot of the... The turnover has now settled down and relationships are starting to forge. You know, with time can yield great outcomes when you have lots of things that have to change all of a sudden. And at Tottenham, we've got through a lot of change very, very quickly whilst also remaining very much competitive at the top end of the league. And obviously we hope we'll go on a bit of a cup run. And so, you know, things look really good with regards how quickly these players are settling together. And the longer they play with each other, the longer the chemistry has to forge and to, to build and the kind of the synergies that, that can result from having a team that have more familiarity playing together and obviously the talent and the levels that we are now trying to, uh, trying to generate. So it's fascinating to me. I'm very excited. Like I say, I'm, 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 I haven't been happier than this as a Tottenham fan for a long, long time, if ever, really. I, f I really do feel optimistic about what's going on at Tottenham. Even the year when we got to the Champions League final, if you remember, we were terrible in the league that year. And so the Champions League was a wonderful distraction from an otherwise you know, pretty ropey and rubbish, forgettable league campaign. But this season, I feel like there's so much positive energy, so many things moving in the right direction that... And every day I can't wait to talk about Tottenham with you guys. And like I say, the Noosa deal might happen next week. By Monday, I've been told that there could be an official bid. And then by Thursday or Friday, hopefully this could be a thing. A few more players potentially going out the door on permanence. Joe Roden, Brian Hill, possibly a Lo Celso or an Ollie Skip. All those players are up for, up for sale, according to reports I've seen. What's interesting is that in those reports that have listed all of these kind of B version, B level players for Tottenham, the two players that have remained off the list are players like Ash Phillips, Dorrington and Jamie Donnelly. That Ange Postacoglu absolutely wants to see these guys hang around the first team regardless of who else goes out the door in the rest of this month. Which is a really good sign for us. A really good sign of their promise, their progress and the hopeful, the optimism that Ange has within them. Good times, guys. Good times. Let me know your thoughts about Conor Gallagher. Do you, do you subscribe to the same vibe as I do? That The more this goes on, the less inclined I am to want it to happen, even though I still support it if it does. As I say, I still see the, the, the validity of the argument of his value, but just a little bit torn on it. And as far as other midfielders to come in for me, I'm very much in preference of a loan deal um, than a permanent one, as I think this summer is going to be brilliantly fascinating and Tottenham can pounce and take advantage like subscribe and comment guys and as always have a wonderful Saturday I'll see you later bye bye